Good morning guys, what is up? We are on our way down to do some barn chores and see what the latest thunderstorm has completely flattened on us. Um, we, it just won't stop raining. We've had this ridiculous amount of rain. Um, massive thunderstorm again last night. Huge torrential amounts of downpour. I don't know what we're gonna do. Um, I think I might actually be losing my potatoes to blight. I keep kind of picking some not so nice looking leaves off them. And the scary thing about that is that it can transfer over to my tomatoes. And uh, yeah, that's not very exciting. So we're just gonna do some barn chores. I've got some spaghetti sauce that needs to go through the pressure canner. Um, everything's so wet down here. There's just so much standing water, it's crazy. It should not be this wet in July. So, um, yeah, so we're gonna do our morning chores. We're going to put some spaghetti sauce in the pressure canner, clean up my kitchen, and then see what else we can get up to today. So the sun is breaking through the mist. I was hoping I was gonna get a little longer, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So the other day, like 10 o'clock at night, I was able to mow down this area of our yard here and there's a few shrubs in here but what i would like to do is turn this whole area there's our baby barn and our house and then we own there's like cedars back there and that's our neighbors so i'd like to turn this into a bit of a food forest i want to put some more apple trees some other fruit trees some berries and just kind of let it overgrow a little bit. So like this cedar is our neighbor's, but this is all ours. I've got an apple tree right here. I did manage to mow up here, but this is where our first barn cat is buried and my kids really want to put something there. So I've got a cherry tree for that. And up here I've got like some nine bark and some hydrangeas. And then all through here, I would like to put some fruit trees. I think it'll uh, be nice near the house and be a good bit of landscaping. So it's absolutely stinking hot outside and um, I'm gonna run my pressure canner in my house and heat my house up. But I made a batch of spaghetti sauce while it was raining and it's just time to get it um, out of my kitchen and on the pantry shelf. It saves me so much freezer space if I can pressure can it. And so that's what we're gonna do. Now, if you're making just a tomato sauce, you can just do it in a water bath canner. I've made a meat sauce, so I'm gonna run this through the pressure canner because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, I know if you're watching this from Europe, they have entirely different uh, processes and uh, than we do over here. I'm in Canada. Uh, the U.S. uses the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and that is what people generally follow, um, but you do you. So my kitchen's an absolute hot mess, and um, that's what happens when you get into the canning season, um, and there's just so much product that needs to be dealt with. Um, I know there's a lot of background noise on this, and that's my range hood running, and my kids are in the house, because it's just way too hot to be outside. You know, if you live in the South, you're gonna laugh at us, but we just don't do this kind of heat, so. Um, my canner will take seven quart jars, so that's what I've got here. Um, I'm going to fill these up, wipe the rims, and then we're going to Oop, that's too much. I'm talking, I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, but that's way too much sauce. Um, you want to keep a really good inch of headspace on these because what happens is the food expands in the canner and it can um, get a little bit of food particles start stuck under the lid and then that's when your seal will actually fail. So I like to err on the side of a little bit less in the jar. So yeah, so my canner holds seven jars. Um, if you're doing quarts, if you're doing pints, I can actually get 18 in there because you can double stack with a pressure canner. So. Ooh. 
So when I make spaghetti sauce, I always make a really nice big batch of it, and then I don't have to worry um, about making it for a while. I probably make it once every six months. I put a whole bunch of it on the shelf, and then when I need a fast meal for my family, I just take a jar, heat it up, and it heats up while I'm boiling the pasta, and away we go. So I used to freeze my sauce. Um, there's definitely a slight texture and flavor change when you um, can your sauce, um, but it's really still quite good. And it saves freezer space where I would rather keep things like beef. Oop, I'm still making a mess here. Got a whole bunch of jalapenos outside and I'm debating on making some um, cowboy candy. I'm not sure if my husband will like it or not. So, all right. So that's basically it. I'm just gonna wipe the rim really well and get it in my pressure canner. So we've got these, they're full. And then I'm just going to, this is just a wet paper towel and we want to make sure that there's no food particles on any of the rims. And then we should get a really good seal. And then these will go in the canner. I have to look up the times every time I do this because I have a really short memory. Um, but I'm pretty sure with the meat, it's actually, it's 90 minutes for quarts. But it could be less. I just have to look it up. Go just like that. So I have quite the stash of Bernardin lids, and that's what I'm still using. Bernardin is kind of like ball in Canada. Um, I understand some people have been having a really hard time with ball lids. Um, these are still working quite well for me. So just finger tight. I usually spin them on and just snug them a little bit with your middle finger and your thumb so you don't over tighten them because if you over tighten them, the lids could buckle. Um, and the air can't escape the jar. There we go. So we'll get those in the canner. So the canner is just um, heating up slowly and then you want to put hot food, hot jars, hot water, or if you want to start your canner cold, you can do cold food, cold jars, and um, a cold canner. And if you put cold food into a hot canner, what will happen, if you put cold food into a hot canner, you could do thermal shock on your jars and your jars could blow. So you just want to put your jars in follow the instructions that come with your canner for how much water to put in it, how to vent it, etc. So this is a Presto, and we're just going to lock it on there and wait right here is the vent. We're going to wait for some steam to start coming out of that ten, time, 10 minutes, and then put the weight on and let it start building pressure. So you can see there's steam coming out of this right here, which is uh, it's backwards. It's really confusing. Um, you can see that just popped up. So this is the safety lock on the canner lid. And you can see the steam coming out right here, real steady. There it is, it's hard to, hard to pick it up. But anyway, so that's coming out. So now I'm gonna set my timer for 10 minutes and then we're gonna pop the weight on. So that's actually a better angle. You can see the steam really coming out of the vent here. 
um, we're just about ready to put the weight on and then I realized after I said that um, this is a dial cage dial gauge canner um, Presso sells them as, as a dial normally you would just put they have a cover that goes on that and it's only 15 pounds and you don't have the option of doing um, 5 pounds 10 pounds and most pressure canning is actually done at 10 pounds and unless you're at a higher elevation and we're not we're only like 500 feet here so it comes with a 15 pound piece that looks like this and what you can you can use this um, if your dial gauge is working um, my dial gauge no longer works when I first got the canner it worked great um, the only issue is, is that here in Canada we don't have extension offices like you do in the US so I can't really get it tested and I was kind of like does it work I don't know so what I discovered is I could get an aftermarket weight for this canner which is this piece here and I will try to get the camera to focus on this and not me mm -hmm. there um, so this comes in I call it a tri weight it has three pieces so this is your five pounds 10 pounds 15 pounds okay now we're only doing 10 pounds for our elevation there's my 10 minute timer I'm gonna turn that off and I know this is a little intimidating I'm actually gonna get an oven mitt because this sucker is a little hard to get on um, it's not as easy as the um, all-american which is fine but it takes a little bit of force but you can get it on there and you just kind of gotta do it just like that and what this allows me to do is continue to use this canner even though this dial gauge doesn't work but leave the dial gauge on there it has to be on there to help with the seal right so once this starts rocking we know we're at 10 pounds you want it to just you want it to do the hula you don't want it to be going too fast just a nice slow rock to it and then we'll set our timer so it's come to pressure and you can see it's just very gently rocking um, you don't want it rocking really hard it's just you're going to lose a lot of steam it's just not necessary um, and it just means it's working it's too too much pressure that it's trying to blow off some of it so and then i know where to set my stove to maintain that um, you can turn your stove down and you only need to keep the stove on or your heat source whatever if you're working on a hot plate or a burner outside or whatever um, just enough to keep that rocking you don't uh, have to run it on high the whole time um, my stove is almost off at this point um, and i'm running a propane stove um, so, so we're going to set the timer for 70 minutes which is um, meat time meat sauce times according to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and that's the time I go with. And then when that's done, turn the heat off, let the pressure completely come down, and let it sit for at least another 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up. So I have this Montmorency cherry um, that I'm going to put next to Marshmallow's grave. Marshmallow was our first barn cat. My kids were absolutely in love with him, and he was the most tolerant of cats. My kids could carry him everywhere. So he's got a little special spot and uh, we're going to put a cherry tree there for him. And then I have a couple other things and I mean I want to make this into like a food forest but I'm not 100% sure what I'm doing or what I want to do. So I have this grape. Um, I think it's uh, a sabre de bois. So and I picked this up in town yesterday and it's just massive. So but I think I want to use it further up the hill here and do like an archway like an entrance into this so this is actually quite the slope um, we're just on this south facing slope headed right for the St. John River so everything that we do we have to kind of pay attention to where the water flows and uh, right now the water actually comes in behind the spirea there's like a, um, a swale in there and it runs down in the spring it is so wet there but we've we've made this swale so most of the water runs down there and the drainage is pretty good and then i have this other dolgo crab apple tree um, that was from uh, a cutting and it looks really good and i'm going to get it planted so i already have one and i'm going to get this one in the ground 
And then I didn't think these made it. Um, couldn't tell you what kind of grapes they are. I'd have to look up the order form from last year. Um, but it would appear that three of the sticks in there are alive, which is really cool. So I've got these, which are more of a table grape. That I remember. They were intended as a table grape. Um, and this one here is more for wine. Um, and it's probably too tart for my kids to eat as a table grape, but I would eat it as a table grape. So that's kind of what we're working on this afternoon. So I have to go get the pickaxe because the ground here is incredibly rocky. And the only way to dig a hole here is with the pickaxe. So I don't know what happened, but I went to put this video together and um, there's no sound. So I'm not on this part anyways. So I'm just gonna show you what I did here yesterday. Um, hopefully there's a tractor running up in the back field here and hopefully it's not too much background noise. Uh, so we planted this cherry tree here yesterday and uh, what we've done is in front of it we've put like a bit of a swale and so what will happen is the water will come down the hill and sit in there a little bit trickle down in before it finishes rolling down the hill which um, will help water this tree so it's really important i just put these rocks around here in case someone gets overzealous with the weed eater um, it's important when you're planting trees not to plant your uh, graft underneath the soil so you want to actually kind of hump this a little bit um, and the water will pool around here but you want to make sure this doesn't get put under the under the ground so i tend to err on keeping it a little bit higher as things sink and uh, that works really well for us so and then over here i actually managed to flag and plant so this is the um this is the dolgo crab apple that i've planted and i flagged it so we can see that it's actually a tree and not a weed and then here there's three of them are the small grapevines um, and I think now that they're in the ground they'll probably take off and then I put the larger grape in the ground up here it's almost like a shrub but anyways and then I did clear out some of the weeds around some of my other shrubs so like this is a nine bark this is hosta it's a hydrangea nine bark and then we've got a couple more hydrangeas and a couple more nine barks um, the problem we had this winter with them is the rodents really chewed the base of this particular nine bark um, this one's called joker and I just, for cut fly arrangements, I love how petite the leaves are. It just does really well. But the rodents got in there, so we're going to clear all the grass out and make sure everything's really clear for the winter. And I might actually try wrapping them to see if I can keep the rodents out. And then this here is my other Dolgo crab apple tree. It's been in the ground for a couple years. Um, last year, this poor thing had been munched right to the ground over the winter under the soil or under the snow and I don't really know what ate it but it's recovered nicely um, and then this winter I'm gonna wrap it really well and protect it from any kind of damage getting eaten so what I'm hoping you can see the flags there for the grapes as I'm hoping to make this kind of a bit of a roadway so that we can get down we're gonna take this hill out and so we can get down to the farm that way and then up in here we're just going to put a bunch of different um, fruit trees and uh, berry bushes probably try and do like a herb spiral or something like that um, because it's close to the house and I cook with a lot of fresh herbs so that's the plan there I also planted yesterday this is an explorer rose I want to say this is John Cabot um, I don't know where the tag is for it now but anyways that's what this is and it has beautiful red blossoms on it it's more of it says it's a climber but it's more of a trailer you'd have to support it to get it to climb and then over here kind of across the way I've got this really nice like trellis 
and I've planted a clematis, which will take off once it sits here for a couple of weeks and gets situated, it will take off. And I'm really excited about it. It's just such a pretty bloom. And it should take this right over and give it a bit of support.